order the May 13, 2024 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's Policy Review Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. To conduct this meeting by virtual means, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Wash, Ms. Pitts, or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Pitts, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Will do. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Ms. Frimpong? Ms. Harvey? Present. Thank you. Dr. Savoy? Ms. Dolotsky? Ms. Pumphrey. Present. Thank you. Thank you have a quorum with three of five present. OK, thank you. Uh, please welcome. call the roll to determine which staff members are present in this meeting. Sure, Dr. Jess Grimm. Present. Thank you, Dr. Raquel Jones. Here. Thank you. Dr. Doug Elmendorf. Present. Thank you. Dr. Kimberly Ferguson. Present. Thank you. Mr. Dixit. Present. Thank you. Dr. Minus. Mr. Roberts. Present. Thank you. Ms. Leanne Schubert. Present. Thank you. And Ms. Howie. Here. Thank you. Ms. Wash. Here. Thank you. I will pass it back to you, Ms. Pumphrey. Thank you. Personal agenda is item B1, policy 5552, use of personal electronic devices. Policy 5552 was added to the PRC schedule at my request. It was before the committee on November 13, 2024 for discussion to determine whether there is a need to revise policy 5552 or whether there is an implementation issue with the policy. At that time, Vice Chair Harvey recommended that the policy be brought back before the committee once the school system had time to determine whether there is consistent implementation of the use of lock boxes. The committee has requested that Dr. Ferguson provide an update. Dr. Ferguson, please proceed. Good afternoon, everyone. So I had an opportunity to poll the uh, middle school administrators about the use of policy, um, the PECD policy, and also the use of the, the cell phone lock boxes. Uh, first, I wanted to know whether or not they were familiar with the policy, um, because as you know, the policy was generated while we were out during COVID. So it kind of was in the background for quite some time. Um, so all of the administrators that replied, I had 14 administrators reply to the survey. All of them were aware of the policy. Um, I did ask them about whether or not they were able to, um, if they allowed the students to use their cell phones at any point in the day. Um, and most of them said that they were, they allowed the students to use their cell phones during lunch um, and in the hallways as appropriate. And there were quite a few that said they don't allow the students to use their cell phones at all. Um, and then we got into the cell phone lock boxes. So I did ask whether or not they confiscated the, the students' phones, at, any students' phones at any point. All of them that, um, responded uh, yes to that question. Um, and then we t I asked whether or not they used the cell phone lock boxes to store the confiscated phones. The majority of them said yes, so this was half and half. Half said that they put the phones in the safe, and the other half said that they used the cell phone lock boxes. Um, one of the more interesting um, points of data that came out was any suggestions for the PECD policy moving forward. 
Um, most of the suggestions were around enforcement, um, asking parents to help us enforce the policy um, by not calling their children during the day, not texting their children during the day, um, a real clear message around parent responsibility, clearer messages um, for expectations in general, clear and consistent messages. Um, there were some suggestions around the yonder bags, and we had that discussion about them being um, very costly for the school system. And most of the staff members that replied to the survey were aware that they're costly, but wanted us to still think about that. Um, they also talked about just more um, accountability on the students, more accountability on the parents, warning letters going being sent home for parents um, so that they are aware of the consequences. Um, and so that was basically it. It was more just around accountability and implementation. So the policy, there was no concerns with the actual policy. The, the concerns with the were the implementation of the policy. So ensuring that students were aware, parents were aware. We did have a recommendation that not only students put their phones away, but teachers put their phones away. Um, so there was one recommendation with that. So um, that's where we are. It's just more, um, and I think one of your points on the at the last meeting was around implementation. So it sounds like that was the main issue. It's not necessarily the boxes. Um, it's just the understanding that phones are supposed to be off and away during instructional time and just consistently implementing that and getting the, the support from families to implement it. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Do we have any questions for Dr. Ferguson from the committee? Um, yes, Ms. Harvey. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ferguson. Uh, so I heard the information that there, you know, there is a desire to have parents more engaged in the enforcement uh, process by being proactive, not texting or calling their um, children during the school day. Are there other aspects of enforcement that were discussed in the survey? And then uh, you said you had 14 responses. That's 14 out of how many? Um, I believe it's 27 for um, middle schools. Um, we only use the middle school, the lock boxes at the middle school level. So those were the administrators that I surveyed. So about you got about 50 about half response. of half responses, yes. Okay. Uh, so and did you get so were there other aspects of enforcement that the respondents uh, talked about, and did you get any um, any suggestions regarding the actual policy? Like, did respondents? give you any feedback that they felt like there were gaps in the policy or things that we hadn't considered in the policy? No, it wasn't around the actual policy. It was more around implementation of the policy. Um, so um, some of the, the, the language that was uh, in the survey or uh, the respondents, they said they talked about a continued clear message of expectations to parents an even clearer message about consequences with consequences when students violate the policy, um, support to uphold the consequences when parents complain at the executive level, a clearer message around parent responsibility for monitoring their child's cell phone use and social media activity. Um, so it was more around enforcement, not necessarily the actual policy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Um, and Ms. Frempong? Okay, there we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is board member Frempong. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson, for the update. And um, this question might have been asked previously, but within the policy itself for um, where it talks about for middle school and high school students, there is a difference between the two as far as middle school is um, under the discretion of uh, the building leaders, but that's not the case for high school. Why was that distinction made in the policy? 
I'd have to um, get back with you on that that response. I don't have the policy in front of me. I've only had, I only have the feedback. Um, okay. so I can I can let me look into that and find out what 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 that distinction is. Okay, thank you. Ms. Frampong, may I ask you a um, clarifying question? Yes. Are you referring to um, under the standards on the, on the policy C where it says there's one, two, and three, one is for grade three and above, two is for high school, and three is for middle school? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to clarify. Um, and my question um, as far as the lock boxes, is that something that was done this year at middle school only in the thought um, being that maybe in the future it would be used in high school? Is this sort of a pilot to try in middle school or is a thought that it's only going to be used in middle school? So um, I think when we, we started the discussion, it was middle school was where we were having the really chronic offenders. So we wanted to start there to see how it worked out. Um, so certainly, yes, definitely a pilot. Um, but once again, like I said before, the issue is more around, um, it's just implementation. So the having a, a place to actually put the phone once you confiscate is not so much the issue. It's more around getting the support to hold students accountable. Okay, and you mentioned that, um, I, I believe you mentioned that some staff members had an interest in using the yonder bags. This, you know, we know that they're expensive, but if that was an option, um, and I'm not sure if you can answer this question, but if we were to move towards using the yonder bags, would that would that be also implementation or would that need to be a policy change in order to be able to um, use those consistently throughout the system? I'm not sure what you mean about policy change. So once again, when, when you think about if you have the tool available, so the yonder bag would be the tool, it would we would require the administrators to actually use the tool. So use the yonder bags. When kids come in with yonder bags, as you know, you come in, you put your phone in the yonder bag right away and your phone is locked the entire day and you can't unlock it until the end of the day. Um, so I'm not sure if you're you're referring to us actually including the language of yonder bags in the rule. I'm not sure we would have to be that specific. Um, I guess if I was being specific about the policy under um, standards 3A, it says the use of portable electronic communication devices during instructional time, unless instructional staff has permitted such use for instructional purposes, is prohibited. Um, so my thought is if we were going to use the yonder bags because of the phones would be locked all day, well, we need to take out that clause that says unless instructional staff has permitted such use for instructional purposes. We would because we wouldn't, the kids would not have access to their phones. Okay, so that would require a policy change. Okay, and Ms. Frembong, you have your hand up again for another question, I believe. Yes, I do. So, um, Dr. Ferguson, I, I heard you say there more concerns were about enforcement um, and just making sure it sounds like that the parents are on board with what the school is is saying as far as um, use of cell phones. So my question would be, and I wouldn't expect this to be all the time, but for those instances where a parent then does need to reach a child or pass that message on, such as I'm picking you up, ride the bus, or vice versa, et cetera. Um, I guess then that would be all funneled through the front offices of the school. And if that's the case, then I guess, you know, it's worked for years. I mean, that's what happened when I was in school, but just, right, making sure that the staff, I guess, in the front office is ready for kind of those um, circumstances where messages need to be passed on to students. Certainly, they could use the phone. They can also use messaging through Schoology. They can use messaging through email. Um, so it, it doesn't have to just be um, the school phone. It could be other um, means to contact the teacher or the the front office secretary to let them know that um, the you know a child needs an early dismissal or you know a different um, way home as far as being picked up or riding the bus. Okay, thank you. I think that's good to know so that there are also 
other avenues available just besides then um, the phone and you can still have access to your child and get the information that's needed. Thank you. Um, Ms. Tulowski, do you have a question? Thank you. Good afternoon. And I was trying to listen um, as Mr. Corns was helping me log in. So I'm a little bit behind the game. Um, so would the bags be used for grades K through 12? Or was it just middle school? And maybe I, I just wasn't hearing clearly. Because um, I have a question. Yon I went yonder bags. Um, so when we initially had the conversation about yonder bags, we were looking at the middle school level only. Um, as I said before, um, we, we targeted middle school because they were the more chronic offenders as far as cell phone use. So that's why we were we were focusing on middle school at that time. OK, and I know that there was a pilot that was going on with the middle school. Yes, um, those were the lock boxes. So so lock boxes, lock boxes and yonder bags are two different things. Um, right. So we did do the pilot with the middle schools with the lock boxes. So we got each middle school got about 20 lock boxes um, that they could put the kids uh, cell phone in uh, until the end of the day and then return the phone at the end of the day. Um, that way it was in a secure place and you can certainly take that lockbox and put it in the safe as well, um, but it would be in an individual lockbox. Okay, and then are there any results of the pilot in terms so, um, of? Oh, okay, so yes. Uh, so when I did the survey, um, most of the uh, staff members said, and I emailed principals only, um, they said that they used the boxes most of them use the boxes and then, or either they use the school safe. So put it in the box, then put it in the safe, or just have it in the box. And um, was there any feedback in terms of positive changes, um, the effect on, you know, when, when the students who had their phones in the box, in terms of engagement and instruction, distractibility, you know, some kind of feedback for the impact on learning? So that question was not a part of my survey. Um, one administrator did offer that um, what helped them was that they, they sent home a letter ahead of time to every child in the building, every parent letting them know about the cell phone policy and about the consequences. They found that that seem to uh, assist with a lot of the cell phone issues. Okay, because I, I mean, I do agree with you that this is really um, implementation, not necessarily governance and policy, but one of the things that I noted in the policy when I was reading it this afternoon mm -hmm. is that the possession and use of the PECD should not interfere with academic instruction, student safety, and a positive school climate. And while middle school may be the, the biggest offense, um, it seems that there is widespread um, use in the high schools as well. Um, so with that being in the policy, um, you know, my concern is that the possession of these PECDs are interfering with academic instruction in both middle and high schools. Understood. So th the the having lock boxes does not um, it does not interfere with the implementation of the actual policy. So right. um, with the policy saying that, you know, high school students can use their their devices, may be able to use their devices during lunch periods, um, that's still an implementation. So we do have not every high school is uh, monitoring the off and away, right? Or they're not there, the kids are not complying. Right. So um, in a lot of cases, you know, you hear the feedback that, you know, it's my mother texting me, it's my father texting me. It's so it's really just around that implementation uh, of the policy and the enforcement of the policy. So certainly we can look at cell phone lockboxes at the high school level. But once again, I think the it's, it's really going to um, it's going to come to the point where we're enforcing the policy um, more more than not. So, um, and that that's really the issue. It's enforcement. It's not it's not right. having a box, having a yonder bag. It's enforcement. 
I no, I I completely agree. And whether it's the bag, whether it's the box, you know, because we don't deal with implementation, we're we're just here to to create the policy, but I'm just noting that because it's in the policy that the possession should not interfere, that's where my concerns come in. And I mean, it just does seem so evident that both in middle school and high school, and, and with all of the studies now with school systems that are now truly restricting the use with all of the positive changes that come when you see that the students are off or off and away or whatever it is, it just seems that the, the call is urgent to, um, to serve our students better in terms of supporting their learning. So it's just a discussion. I'm not, you know, I, it feels, I feel like we're on the same page. It's just because it is in the policy that it should not interfere. Um, you know, it's just a calling to all of us that something has to, to give to, um, to serve our students better. And thank you for all that you've done to, um, to support this. Dr. Jones, did you have a comment? Yes, thank you. I, I, I raised my hand earlier just to address the um, the comment, but um, Dr. Ferguson did around whether a question was asked about, um, you know, the use of it or any feedback from principals. While that was not a formal question, one of the things I continue to do as I visit schools, especially our middle schools, is to really um, get feedback. The, um, the yonder bags or, um, and the lock boxes are actually um, items or objects that are used to put away the um, the cell phones or to keep students from using them during the day. Yonder is actually the brand. The lock box is more of kind of what it what it actually um, what it looks like. And so one of the things that we've been thinking about is making sure that the provision of those lock boxes or items are available for for our middle schools. Um, and our middle school um, students, based on what middle school you talk to, you get various feedback, but everyone agrees that um, in the day and age that we're living in, we want to make sure that students who have cell phones have that accessibility to parents before and after school, you know, as it relates to emergencies or things like that. But in school, that that is not a, um, a tool that is used as a distraction. So I was just, I'd raised my hand earlier just to say that we are looking at exploring opportunities and ways that all of our students in secondary, I know high school came up, um, yonder bags and lock boxes have not been broached with our high schools, but we are working this summer to make sure that we continue to have standard expectations for policies and rules and to make sure that they are implemented in our schools in accordance with the way that they are, um, that they are written. But it is something that all of our teams are taking a look at to make sure that policy and rule are being followed. It is my understanding that middle school was used as a group to pilot or use these lock boxes based on um, advisory groups that were had and it came out of the middle school level. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Ms. Harvey, did you have a question? I, I did. Uh, uh, much of this conversation is really about the distinction between implementation and enforcement. So when I read the rule, I see all the guidelines, but I'm curious as to what the administrator's understanding is as to how the rule is enforced. Do they know, is, is there a tiered step process? Like if this is when your phone gets put in a lockbox, um, this is when you have to, you know, do something different uh, regarding your phone. Is that a clear, um, is that a clear process with, uh, within the administration among school leaders and teachers as far as enforcement of the rule? I'll, you want to answer that? You want to go first? No, go ahead, Dr. Jones. Okay. No, I was going to say yes, yes. There are, um, there, there are um, cell phone um, cell phone guidelines that are used 
and shared with families as a result of of the rule and students being informed very early on in the beginning of the school year during town halls during student or class meetings around not having their cell phones out during certain times of the day and then what happens if you do take it out um, then you'll be of course asked to put it away if you continue to operate in an egregious nature then of course the lockbox is something um, is something that is used most students um, respond to an initial warning regarding their cell phone, but then there are some who continue to require other means. But I have seen, and the executive directors have um, received and collected from high schools and uh, middle schools in particular, those guidelines that are um, family friendly or family centered around the policy and rule for, for cell phones and the um, process by, of of which all schools are expected to follow so those are those are in place so yes there is a process as it relates to implementation i do think a lot of our schools are implement are implementing the policies and the rules i know um dr ferguson brought up you know the implementation of it it's just really thinking about how are we continuing to handle some of the more egregious um or repeated offenses and schools have things in process for that too and we'll be looking um, later on today as it relates to those policies for um, you know student conduct and things of that nature and just one quick last question are the enforcement guidelines school specific or system specific um so if you don't mind dr jones the so the cell phone policy is in our student handbook um, and it's, in, it's included in the student handbook. So um, all of the administrators received a, a PowerPoint presentation that they went over with their, their um, students at the beginning of the school year before the students had take, took the student handbook home to be signed off by the parents. So there was there is an understanding. Um, the PCD policy was in that presentation um, and what our... Um, the the consequences of using cell phones, um, the consequences of using cell phones inappropriately, all of that is in the student handbook and was included in the PowerPoint presentation uh, for um, our administrators to share with their students. Right, but are those consequences specific to each individual school or are the consequences the same across all schools? So when we look at the consequences in the student handbook, those consequences are for all students. OK. OK, thank you. OK, do we have any other questions or comments from board members? OK, so um, based on our discussion, how does the committee wish to proceed as far as this policy? Do we think any changes need to be made? Do we want to? How do we wish to proceed? Ms. Harvey? So uh, I, my recommendation would be that we uh, let the policy stand, notwithstanding the clarification that uh, Ms. Frimpong asked for, that may need to be a tweak in the policy, but this doesn't appear to be a policy issue, but more of an implementation and enforcement issue. So that would be my recommendation. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Uh, Ms. Tulesky. Uh, thank you. I completely agree with Ms. Harvey. My only concern in the policy is in the, um, the initial statement, and I know I'm kind of sticking on this, where it says that the board believes possession use should not interfere with instruction because we can't control that, right? If that depends on the implementation mm -hmm. and the enforcement, um, you know, when I read that, you know, I just feel in my heart that it is interfering, but um, that's not in our control. And I know, I, I don't know, maybe I'm like just stuck on the words. I'm not sure. Um, and I and I do agree with everybody that, you know, it does need to be implemented more consistently or with consistency, but um, that is in the policy and that just concerns me. 
you know, I don't know. And Ms. Alec? You, yes, Ms. if Alec? I may. Thank you, uh, board members. Uh, Ms. Teleski, uh, uh, if you, as the kids say, flip the script, uh, I don't think that the language, uh, if you take it out of the policy, um, it doesn't state what the board believes. So this is a statement of belief, not a statement that we're going to enforce it. That's what you get to at the end. This is a statement of what you believe the negative effects of having cell phone use during the instructional day would be. Right. No, I, right. I, I agree. And, and, and to have our belief there is fine. Um, but, you know, again, I don't, you know, it just, it just really bothered me because the, the enforcement is what's really concerning. So, but that's not our, our domain, but. Okay, so based on my discussion, my understanding is based on our discussion here, um, the committee at this point does not see any need to make any changes to the policy as is. Any objection to that? This is board okay. member from Pong. Oh, yes. Go ahead, Ms. Frampong. So, yes, just based on, I guess, awaiting some of the clarification, um, because I don't know if you're with what you're asking, are you asking if we should move forward with it just yet? And so I would just ask, I guess, maybe for a pause for the clarification um, so that there's some understanding around that. And then we could um, move forward or determine if there needs to be a tweak or an adjustment and then move it forward. So this was a policy that um, we were, it wasn't on our list this year for review. It wasn't up for review, but we added it just to see, um, to talk about whether um, some of the issues that were discussed by the board, that were brought forward by the board were um, implementation, which would follow, uh, you, you know, the rule or there needed to be a policy change. So um, we don't really need to move forward with anything. We just need to decide if we needed to make a, you know, it can stay as is if we weren't uh, proposing any changes at this point. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, committee members. Um, next on our agenda is item C1, policy 5550, student behavior code, and policy 5560, suspensions and expulsions. These policies were discussed at the November 13th, 2023 PRC meeting and placed on the agenda today to discuss the legal parameters of the confidentiality of student discipline and its impact on public trust in the school system's consistent enforcement of these policies. Ms. Howie, please proceed. Um, if I may, uh, members of the committee, you are uh, somewhat behind and you have several. This is this is a weighty issue and we've already uh, don't we have uh, tried to give this about 15 minutes, which I think will take every bit of that 15 minutes. Uh, if I could ask, given the number of staff members who are here, that we proceed with uh, the other parts of the agenda. Uh, and then return to 5550 and 5560 after staff who are not needed for these policies are excused. I'm fine with that. And committee members um, object to that. Okay, so we will uh, proceed and move forward to item D1, which is policy 3540, Energy Conservation and Sustainability. This policy was placed on PRC's schedule as a carryover from the 2022-2023 school year in response to um, the student member of the board, Christian Thomas's motion that policy 3540 be reviewed in light of the Energy Management and Sustainability Work Group's recommendations. However, the board has not formed a work group. Nevertheless, the Department of Facilities Management and Strategic Planning has recommendations for changes to the policy. Uh, Mr. Dixit, please proceed when you're ready. Good afternoon. Uh, you have provided the background of this policy. Um, we have gone ahead and made editorial changes. Uh, I'll just briefly state the changes. Uh, line eight removed learning because it was redundant. Line nine uh, changed sustainability to sustainable. Line 19 change capitalization of state to be consistent with other instances of using state. Uh, line 31, reporting in lower case. So these were some of the changes that we have made, editorial changes. 
The other change that has been made is that the environmental and sustainability certifications, it used to be only LEED and Green Globe, which is an equivalent uh, certification, has been added to that. In addition to that, uh, there has been hyperlink provided consistent with public works recommendation to the superintendent's rule. Uh, there are no fiscal impact with any of the changes that we have made in, in, in implementing this policy. If there are any questions, we'd be glad to respond to them. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Do any committee members have any questions or comments at this point? OK. If there are no corrections and no objections, policy 3540 is moved forward for first reader as presented. Next on our agenda is item Thank D2. You. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Sorry. And may um, Mr. Dixit and Dr. Grim be excused, members of the committee. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item D2, policy 5410, school counseling services. And for that, we call on Dr. Ferguson. Good afternoon again. Um, so um, the school counseling policy, um, the purpose is so that um, we explain to our community the purpose of school counseling services and um, specifically what they do. Uh, most of the recommendations by the committee, we, we did have a committee to come together to review the policy and make recommendations, um, included several staff members. Um, we did have two parents and um, school-based staff members, so school-based school counselors. We had an administrator. We included an executive director and some central office staff members. Uh, we came together to make some recommendations to policy 5410, and most of the recommendations for the policy were just cleaning up the language um, for the policy. As you can see, it was changing a word here, adding a word there, um, updating some of the language as it relates to um, our current vision as a school system, um, including our reference to culturally responsive um, services, that has been that was the bulk of the recommendations for the policy. Um, and when we did look, review some additional policies, we found a couple of policies uh, in one in Anne Arundel County and one in Montgomery County um, where they included. They did have uh, a policy that specifically related to school counseling. Uh, Anne Arundel called their student services and Montgomery school counseling programs. Um, there were not any other LEAs that specifically focused on school counseling for um, a policy, um, but more around the global provision of student services. Were there any questions around this particular policy? Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Any questions from committee? Oh, sorry, uh, Ms. Frampong, you have a question? Yes, I do have a question. So one of the things um, that is now available to the students is the talk space. So is there a separate policy or something governing that or would that also fall under like the school counseling services? Uh, no, so talk space is not necessarily a school counseling service. That is something that's through uh, mental health services. Um, and school counselors, it doesn't replace school counseling. It is a um, it's a supplement support, a supplementary support for our students who find that they may need to speak with someone else, um, but not necessarily related to um, the work of our school counselors. OK, so then for the mental health services, that sounds like then that would be under a different policy and that's where kind of anything governing something a support like you said like talk space that's where we would find that type of information most likely i'm scanning i'm scanning the five thousands right now to see if that would be in any of those hmm. not sure i'd have to look through some of them to see whether or not um that anything around 
uh, supplementary mental health supports are in any of our five thousands. Um, I can't I can't say off the top of my head, but I'd have to scan those um, and take a look and see if that language is in any of those policies. Okay, thank you. I did appreciate the um, detail analysis and the policy analysis for this. Did explain all the um, recommend recommendations from staff. I thought that was very helpful. Um, I just wanted to mention that. So thank you for that. Um, any other questions or comments from board uh, from committee members? Okay. If there are no corrections and no objections, policy fifty four ten is moved forward for first reader as presented. Thank you. Members of the committee, may Dr. Ferguson be excused. Yes, thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good day. You too. Next on our agenda is item D3, policy 5610, school-sponsored media student journalists. And for that, for that, we call on Dr. Jones. Thank you. Thank you, um, policy review committee. Um, the Department of Schools and the um, Division of CNI had an opportunity to review policy, um, the policy to make any necessary adjustments. Um, there were small adjustments made as it relates to the language of the policy. We were able to uh, research and look into other policies adopted by um, some of our neighboring local school systems and presented the policy again with minimal um, revisions as it relates to school sponsored media student um, journalists. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. At Jones, any questions or comments from committee members? I would just say once again, I appreciated the detailed analysis here um, and uh, the inclusion of the different um, policies from LEAs. It was helpful to see those changes, even though although you mentioned that they're minimal changes, it's it was good to see the details and the whys so that we know, you know, see the thorough analysis of the policy and staff's recommendation that for just simply minor changes. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. OK, if there are no corrections and no objections, policy 5610 is moved forward for first reader as presented. And next on our agenda is item D4, policy 6600 educational options program. And for, for that, we call on Dr. Elmendorf. Hi, good evening. <clears throat> yes, this is um, policy had um, relatively minor changes, I would say. We focused on providing more clarity in our wording, um, especially when we were uh, in the previous policy being specific to things like secondary. We wanna make sure that we are clear that the, um, options in the academic programs and options department are often open to students who are not just in secondary schools and we also um, since this policy was in place before have changed names to certain things and so a lot of the changes in here are actually just name changes based on structural or um, organizational name changes and then um, there were some conventions that we wanted to make sure that we implemented um, appropriately so to, to clean up the policy where where appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments from committee members? I did have a question regarding um, under the standards of uh, removing the um, the uh, under number three, removing the sentence that says or the statement that says ensuring ensure students attending Title I schools receive ongoing learning opportunities. Um, my understanding is that's being removed because it's included in the other language and it's duplicative. Um, I just wanted to, to I just, I, I was a little bit concerned about that, although I can see where it's duplicative. Um, the Title I schools I know have our students who are in most need, so it concern, it's, have, have a slight concern about removing that language. Um, so I guess my question is, if we were to leave that in, is there an issue with leaving it in or is it simply duplicative? I, we were trying to be comprehensive um, and say all students as opposed to, you know, being particular about students in schools that change status from Title I one year to not Title I the next year kind of thing. So we were just trying to be more consistent and overarching, comprehensive with our wording. Okay, thank you. I think the shifting 
uh, criteria for Title I schools means that the schools are can be Title I at one point and then not Title I at another point. And so rather than trying to pinpoint what the policy, which schools the policy uh, applies to, we wanted to make sure it applies to all schools. Okay, thank you. That's that's very helpful. See, I think there was one other question I had. No, I think that was it for me. Anybody else, any other committee members have any questions or comments? Okay, if there are no corrections and no objections, policy 6600 is moved forward for first reader as presented. Thank you. Thank you. And members of the committee, may um, Ms. Would may Dr. Almendorf and Ms. Schubert be excused, please? Yes, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And members and of the committee, I do. Oh, I see her. I'm sorry. Um, would you like me to proceed with um, the 5550 and 5560 discussion. Yes, that's what I was about to, about to ask if you wanted to go back to that or if you wanted to uh, move on with the calendar. So, yes, let's move back to 5550 and 5560, please. Surely. Um, so, members of the committee, I was tasked with uh, returning to you to discuss specifically what some of the legal impediments were, uh, the concerns that were expressed by the committee were that uh, because uh, the ultimate disciplinary uh, uh, infractions were not reported to the public that there was a lack of trust, I believe, were the words that were used at the uh, at the last committee meeting when this was discussed. So uh, the, the question as to whether or not the the school system has the ability under the law to uh, basically report to parents uh, what is uh, what kind of discipline is imposed uh, on students? I have two answers for you. No and no. And I'm going to explain uh, each of those no's to you. First, to talk about federal law, and that would be the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act found at 20 USC 1232G. And the uh, which is uh, uh, named FERPA. So FERPA defines education records, and education records are those which contain information directly related to a student and that are maintained by the educational agency. There is no definition in FERPA itself for discipline records. It doesn't say that discipline records are education records or are student records. However, the Family Policy Compliance Office of the U.S. Department of Education has believed so strongly that discipline records are a part of education records that it actually sued the university uh, or the Miami University in Ohio uh, back in 1998. In that particular case, what happened was uh, some journalists uh, asked for discipline records of certain students, they were asked over a, a certain period of time. And some of them were turned over to the, the, uh, the journalists. The Department of Education sought an injunction preventing the university from uh, issuing, from giving any more information. And that injunction was upheld uh, in district court and then ultimately in the Sixth Circuit. And what the Sixth Circuit and the district court said, um, and this was, this case came out in 2000, was that as the agency that interprets uh, FERPA that interprets um, this particular statute that the Department of Education, when it believed and interpreted education records, uh, including being inclusive of discipline records, that they were entitled to deference. And in fact, the injunction held, as I said, um, at the, the Sixth Circuit level as well. Now, there have been some adjustments to FERPA uh, or amendments to FERPA, I should say, specifically subsection 6A as in Apple, 
Um, and in that particular section, what is permitted for an institution of post-secondary education, so not K to 12, is that uh, that institution can disclose to a victim of a crime of violence any disciplinary action that's been imposed on a student. But again, that has to do with post-secondary uh, institutions, which we're not. So that's the first no. The second no I see coming from COMAR, coming from state regulation, and specifically it's COMAR 13A.08.02.18. And uh, there, it's, it's the same language basically that is in um, the in FERPA. Uh, it indicates that there's prior consent for disclosure. There are actually two sections, uh, 0.18 and 0.19. So prior dis consent for disclosure when it is required and prior consent when it is not. And here, um, again, the language tracking FERPA, the prior consent for disclosure of what's in an education record, uh, the and again defining discipline records as part of student records or education records, that the parents' prior consent would be uh, necessary because we we would be giving more than simply directory information, which is uh, just overall identification of that student, so grades that they're in. Uh, whether or not they receive honors. Uh, as you know, we have a presidential scholar, so that information can be released to the press unless uh, the parent seeks directory information to be uh, suppressed. So uh, unfortunately for members of the public, um, we are constrained, I believe, by both federal law and state regulation uh, from disclosing anything more about students and student disciplinary um, outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Um, Dr. James, did you also, were you also going to speak about how discipline is handled at the school level? I can, I can share more. It's very aligned to what um, Ms. Howie just shared. We follow, um, you know, federal law, we follow, um, you know, state law as it relates to how it's handled. Of course, we know we have our policies that are in place 5550 and 5560 that are aligned with um, with those laws and student privacy is at the center of it. So it is definitely aligned with what um, Ms. Howie said. We just make sure at the school level that all policies and rules are followed when um, student discipline is actually um, implemented and that um, both um, student who um, could be considered to be a victim or students who are indeed actually um, having consequences um, as it relates to their offenses are held to student privacy laws that we maintain in the Department of School Safety and as it relates to our student conduct hearing officers and our principals who work to implement policy and rule. Thank you. And committee members, is there any discussion on whether the committee needs to review policy 5500, excuse me, 5500, yes, and 5560? I did have one um, quick, just specific question. Um, for for category one offenses for fighting and then category two offenses where it says um, physical attacks on students, um, what would be the difference between a fight and a physical attack on a student? I can answer that question. As you can imagine, it is a um, it is a case by it is a case by case basis as it relates to a fight um, where two individuals are engaging in unfortunate circumstances and then physical attack doesn't necessarily have to be a fight. Um, you know, it could just be um, exactly what it is labeled, um, physical attack on on an individual. Those are kind of like the basic understandings um, of it. Sometimes, unfortunately, physical attack leads to a fight, but a lot of times fights kind of involve as it say, states, two people or two individuals or more than two individuals. So that's the initial difference there. 
um, an unwarranted physical attack on any student, of course, is um, followed up by um, different consequences. And so that's probably why you see the, the variation in, in category and the range of consequences at the school level. Thank you. Any other comments from committee members as far as how we should proceed? OK, so um, I'm hearing that based on our on the discussion, we will proceed by taking no further action unless there's any objection or comment from other board members. OK, thank you. Um, now I believe we're moving back down to. Proposed meeting dates proposed and meeting uh, dates. Yes, uh, members of the committee may Dr. Jones be excused. Yes, thank you, Dr. Jones. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Okay, Ms. Harry, you're going to discuss the sure excuse me, proposed meeting dates. Yes, and uh, I cannot take credit for having uh, put these in the calendar. Uh, it was um, Ms. Gover who is uh, super efficient. Um, she has uh, planned these based on the fact that we've had our meetings regularly on Mondays. Uh, that in January there is not usually a PRC meeting, given how heavy your schedule is with the budget uh, and your additional budget hearings. And then usually there's not a meeting in April because of NSBA and uh, usually spring break. So with those two um, addition or deletions, I should say, which are normal for this committee, these are the proposed dates and these are all on Mondays next year. Thank you, Ms. Howie. I just have a quick question. As far as um, where we are on track this year with the policies that were for review um, mm -hmm. based upon the months where we did not have meetings, do you think we are um, you know, on track the way we should be, or do you think in the future those meetings, additional meetings may be needed, in your opinion? And I think we're in a, a decent place, members of the committee. Um, Ms. Wash, if you disagree, please, uh, please chime in. Yeah, <laughs> so... We we are revisiting 1270 and 1280 in June. Um, and 0100, we have to revisit. Uh, we didn't conclude the review of 0100. That went to the Equity Committee. Um, and also, I believe 0200, Precepts, Beliefs, and Values, um, drop to the floor, if I have that right, at the board meeting. So it's those four policies that are, uh, that we did have not concluded this year, at, at least not yet. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Harvey, did you have a comment or a question? Yes, just a clarification. On the calendar, mm -hmm. it has a meeting date of 11 slash 49. And just wanted What's the actual date? I think that's just November 4th. That's the oh, Monday. I'm sorry, that is November. That is your board meeting. So that would be that November 4th. And I apologize for the uh, the typo. We'll make oh, sure that's, that's corrected good. when it's loaded. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. OK, um, hearing no other objections, the dates are adopted and will be posted on the board's website. Thank you. Thank you. A staff member has requested that the board consider a change in policy 4104 acceptable use policy for technology and social media for authorized users. Ms. Howie has agreed to provide the committee with a general overview of intellectual property and copyright law. Ms. Howie, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, members of the committee, I did provide uh, for your review a memo that was a little bit more comprehensive uh, just to make sure I touched all of the uh, the issues that I identified in this request. Specifically, the request um, asked that there be a change to your TAUP, your telecommunications acceptable use policy, and that the board consider indicating explicitly that not all uh, information that is placed on your networks is presumed to be owned by the Board of Education. Uh, 
and I expressed my concerns as indicated in my memo. Um, I did outline some of the intellectual property issues, but one issue that I do want to highlight that is also addressed in the memo is the Maryland Public Information Act, which again, the employee may not have been aware of um, when the um, when the query was posed. Uh, the assumption that the school system makes, uh, and in my opinion, has to make that uh, when information, when documents are placed on our servers, that they're ours. And if there is a request for documents, and I think some of you do this with your email, that you tell uh, members of the public, hey, if you email me, understand if this is done as part of, because this is done on BCPS networks, and because my email is subject to the Maryland Public Information Act, with some exclusions and exceptions, obviously, then my email may have to be disclosed uh, if there is a request. And I don't think that was one of the considerations um, that was um, that was uh, part of this analysis and part of this request. And again, when I looked at the memo again and considered uh, the discussion with you this afternoon, I think that in addition to some of the ownership issues under copyright, Title 17 of the US Code, that um, it is a presumption, and in my opinion, has to be a presumption that if it's on our server, we get to look at it. We get to know whether or not it's ours. You can't have it both ways. Um, and to presume that we would have to ask for every document, hey, can we release this to the public or is this really ours? I think is labor intensive and is, um, is just not practical uh, for the system. Now, uh, there is and there has been in the past couple of years, uh, uh, more entrepreneurship, shall, I guess I could say it that way, on the part of um, our instructional leaders and our classroom teachers. Uh, this was not uh, what was envisioned when my grandmother started teaching in 1926 or when my mother started teaching in 1966. Um, it was you work for the school system and what you did, you did. And even if you did it on your own time, uh, that it was more than likely the school systems because teachers weren't seeking to uh, to sell their intellectual property. So our uh, ethics committee, our, your ethics panel, your ethics review panel, uh, does consider whether or not uh, certain uh, products are actually created with board on board time and you there is in the memo cited at least one instance uh, that the the panel reviewed uh, to determine whether or not an individual teacher could in fact claim that certain um, intellectual property was theirs and not the school systems. Uh, and that individual, as I recall, it was a textbook, if I'm not mistaken, but that is that's cited in the memo to you. And again, you may want to encourage entrepreneurship among uh, your classroom teachers, and that's not a bad thing. It's just managing it, that the expectation that um, your staff would manage that would be more difficult to uh, to administer. So I'm happy to take any questions. Any members, any questions or comments for Ms. Howie? Ms. Howie, I do thank you for the detailed memo. It was um, it explained everything very well, and I, I appreciate um, that we were provided with that information so that we can make an informed decision on how to proceed. And based on no further discussion, I'm thinking that we are going to proceed by not making any changes to policy 4104. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Howie. You're welcome. Um, the floor is now open to members of the committee to discuss issues of concern. I must emphasize that this is not the time to conduct business as there has not been notice provided as required by the Open Meetings Act. Any other discussion? No. The next meeting of the Policy Review Committee is scheduled for Wednesday, June 12th 
at 4.30 p.m. Please note that the meeting is scheduled for Wednesday as opposed to our usual meeting day of Monday. And because there is no further business, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening, members. Thank you. Have a good, good night, night, everybody. Bye-bye.